Okay, hi folks. Um, contrary to the um, program, this is going to be a collective presentation on the part of the Evoke Laboratory at UC Irvine um, in the Department of Informatics. Um, I'm, I'm going to top and tail it. Um, Corey Knobel, who's the director of the lab, um, will be describing um, one set of work that we've, we've been doing, and John Seberger uh, will be discussing a second. Um, so how do I do this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was struck with, Phil Bourne made the really interesting point about, you know, scientists getting into new modes of um, reading right now. Um, and one of the, my favorite recent phrases is LPU, which is least publishable unit. What's the least that you can publish in order to get recognition for what you're doing? And when we're creating objects like that, we think it's sort of problematic objects. Um, what we're interested in digitally um, is understanding both the new kinds of objects that are being produced and ways in which they can be produced. So the project, the overall project has two, these two dimensions. The first we characterize as knowledge infrastructures, building knowledge infrastructures, going beyond the concept of information infrastructure to saying what are the bundles that we need to put into place in order to get the right set of visual designers, database designers, um, humanities scholars, scientists, whatever, in order to create new kinds of knowledge object. Um, Daniel O'Donnell um, made a really nice point a little bit earlier about going back to first principles. And we really take this whole project as a chance to go back to first principles. What is the nature of knowledge and what new kinds of knowledge can we produce? Um, so we're particularly interested in investigating um, new ontologies and new, on, uh, and new epistemologies as they're coming out of these new forms that we're creating. So we're not thinking about porting the knowledge that we already know and love into a digital format. We're talking about learning ways to read and recognize and create new forms of knowledge. Uh, now, this range will include things like databases, which Johanna discussed so beautifully just now. Uh, my favorite quote recently on that is from um, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, writing in the 50s, I think. Oh, no, he couldn't have written in the 50s. Uh, <laughs> bad Walter. Um, and even today, as the current scientific method teaches us, the book is an archaic intermediate between two different card index systems. For everything substantial is found in the slip box of the researcher who wrote it and the scholar who studies in it assimilates into its, assimilated into its own card index. We're also looking at performance, immersive, uh, immersive environments, and critical making, um, as Sean and uh, Nina were talking about earlier today, and also Matt Ratto has been working on in Toronto. Today, Corey will talk about, uh, Corey Knobel will talk about new forms of representation and epistemology, and John Seberger will describe the ontological implications of a project in our lab to remediate Derrida's archive fever and make it utterly accessible. So, okay. Um, so, hello, um, and as Jeff said, I'm going to be uh, discussing a little bit a project that we have going on in the Evoke Lab that's called Fever Book. Uh, the name will start to make sense uh, if it hasn't already uh, shortly. So there are three issues to address, the what, the why, and really the so what, because um, let's face it, Derrida and Facebook are not, you know, uh, predictable partners. Um, <clears throat> so what we're looking at right now is an early mock-up, um, and I stress early, on one of the user interfaces that will be part of the Feverbook project. And the Feverbook project is uh, an interactive exhibit, I suppose, um, that will allow users to sort of get to know or uh, to experience Derrida's theory of the archive through a space in which many of us sort of live in and live out uh, on a daily basis, and that is Facebook. So hence, Archive Fever plus Facebook equals Feverbook. Um, I, for the sake of time, I think um, I'm going to breeze through some of the functionality of this uh, diagram. I will be more than happy to answer, or answer questions later on about how it works, its place in the exhibit, uh, as well as how it was designed um, through empirical methods. Um, so with the what, um, now it's, it's sort of a question of addressing the why. Um, and so if anybody in here has read Archive Fever, I don't think uh, you'll disagree when I say it is complicated, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say I found it to be remarkably frustrating. Um, and it's frustrating for a number of reasons, um, not the least of which is its textuality. 
and this is compounded by the fact that Derrida, ever the Joker, right, is um, really playing aggressively at the affordances of the text. And what this, uh, what this yields is a highly topological narrative. Uh, so in other words, we have a narrative plane that's presented not as a flat plane, but as something that is richly folded, highly convoluted, um, to the point that you know, the, the reader's, uh, the progress of the reader's uh, eye over the, the text does not directly correlate to the progress of time in the, temporal, uh, in the temporality of the text. You're always sort of moving forwards and backwards in this way. It resembles Lawrence Stern's uh, Tristram Shandy quite a bit. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a really rich theory of the archive, and despite, I guess because of uh, the frustrating nature of the text, um, we all started thinking about a different way to present this. How might we present uh, archive fever such that the reader doesn't quite have to struggle so much, or maybe the points that Derrida is making uh, hit home a little bit more? Um, and so, Sort of with, with that explanation of, of why, um, there's the so what. You know, I mean, a, a cool project is a cool project, but that isn't necessarily like a justification for it. Um, I think, you know, the reason that we've decided to present this today uh, is that this sort of embodies one of the ways that we're looking at new forms of scholarly communication. Uh, and, you know, sort of going back to first principles as we've been discussing uh, this afternoon. Um, we're taking a really close look at the way scholarly communications have manifest themselves in the past. Uh, and I don't think many would disagree when I, if I were to say that text is the dominant archival form. Um, and text is really great at, at affording one of the two ways of, of knowing that Bertrand Russell talked about um, you know, years ago, uh, the, the first of which is knowledge by acquaintance, and the second of which is knowledge by description. Text is, of course, better at uh, facilitating knowledge by description than it is knowledge by acquaintance. Um, this becomes problematic, and I think theoret theoretically interesting, when we do take as a given that text is the primary, uh, the predominant uh, archival form, and within sort of um, the, the positive, positive, positivist, excuse me, uh, archive that, that Foucault discusses in the Archaeology of Knowledge, um, we have this sort of lossy process by which the researcher's uh, knowledge by acquaintance is reduced to the reader's knowledge by description. Um, and so with, with the Fever Book Project, we're trying to sort of look at ways in which we can enrich text. And I'm not suggesting that we get rid of it, that we move to a non-textual realm but ways in which we might enrich text such that knowledge by description can be made to more closely approximate knowledge by acquaintance. Um, with that said, I think I'm going to turn things over to Jeff. Uh, thank you. Or, or Corey, sorry. All right. Well, one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the difficulties at going at the end of the day is you know exactly which choir to whom you're singing. Um, and also a lot of the things that you wanted to say <laughs> have already been brought up. So. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that we've talked about a bit is, is, is this um, consilience between the sciences and the humanities and, and the different, kind of, I guess, the geographies or geography, the countries of, of knowledge and ways of knowing that are, are very well ingrained in the academy. Um, but I wanted to talk a bit today about, <clears throat> uh, based off a paper that I actually just had my undergraduate class read about bidirectional shaping. Uh, and, in particular, this paper talked about how biology and computation over time have reconstructed each other, which has resulted in the forms and formats and approaches to genomic databases. Uh, and I was thinking about the talk to give today and expanding upon that idea of not just bi-directional, but multi-directional multi shaping in the ways that the sciences and the humanities are influencing each other contemporarily through the use of computational tools. So uh, this is one of those references that you either love or you hate. Um, <clears throat> but Mary Douglas's thinking in circles, for me, brings up some interesting ways to think and talk about the intersections of art, science, and humanities, not in any way as a critique of, of Mary Douglas's engagement with the biblical content, but really more uh, in the terms of choosing or recognizing alternative metaphors 
to the linear text. So one of the questions was why have we lost and are we rediscovering the art of circular writing and reading? Which, if we think about uh, you know, our, our literary traditions, they come out in, in very linear textual forms, but as John pointed out before and as others have pointed out, many, many texts and expressions are topologically much more complex and much more interesting. Uh, you know, jumping from the example uh, presented in Douglas's book is here is a representation of um, collocations within the entire, within the Bible. And the point of this is not so much the wow factor that Johanna talked about, because that, that actually is not the point, that's the least interesting thing about this, is the interesting point is that representations like this, alternative representations, uh, are not supposed to be our objects of fetish, and they are not supposed to be reified. What they do is open up new hermeneutic spaces for scholars who know how to use this knowledge, uh, who have that kind of acquaintance and the interest to open up new types of questions to ask. So uh, this is one way in which um, computation and computational tools can potentially transform the practices of uh, social sciences and humanities um, and the sciences as well. Uh, on the other hand, how, how, um, how do we transform the sciences in, in the other direction, and how does computation do that? Um, our representations of genes have for a long time been linear. We represent them as letters, and we write, we, we have adapted the way you can describe life into the way you can write into a book. <clears throat> However, the, you know, we know now that the patterns of interaction are far more complex, and an innovation again, taking the circular format, was moving to representing the genome in a visual way on a circle instead of this linear textual format. And what we find is that in doing it, people with the requisite knowledge, genomicists, can detect new types of patterns just, and, and from these representations. Now again, this is not the knowledge. This is the representation that leads to new types of questions that lead to new knowledge. And as representational forms, people can engage a lot of creativity and in fact, think about the role of computation and data and tools and visualizations as a form of ludic engagement with knowledge. So as you can see here, even in the circular representation, people have decomposed this into a vast array of types of representations that serve them, their communities, and the communicative forms that they need. Finally, the humanities has, have also taken some of these metaphors of science to expose new types of patterns and open up new types of questions. For example, the use of network representations in showing relationships in literature. Uh, another is applying statistical forms to large corpuses of textual and linguistic data to look at patterns that evolve over time. And finally, uh, in terms of uh, uh, exposing patterns of authorship, uh, this is a, an example of a program called History Flow, which looks at the authorship changes in uh, online documents like Wikipedia, some of which are very stable and some of which are highly contentious, but can show the history of how an actual document, which is very linearized and, and consolidated at the end, actually is a complex process over time. Uh, this is also being used right now, um, not just in humanities to look at documents, but also in social sciences. Um, Judy Olson at Irvine is using this to look at how Google Docs change over time as a form of collaborative work. So in this way, um, you know, these, these computational tools and the adoption of metaphors, you know, circularity of statistics, these things into the sciences, there's a multidirectional shaping of the sciences, arts, and humanities through the tools of computation. So how do we think about getting away from these linear, linear kind of states that are very easy and very, are very entrenched um, and are in many ways sometimes unf unfortunately and unfairly ascribed to uh, text uh, because text is, is, as we've said, very useful. We don't want to get rid of it. But what we want to recognize is that text is one among a very broad portfolio of representations that are useful 
to our, our types of scholarship. But one way to, and I was thinking about just what are easy ways to keep moving forward in this, because this is not a goal, it's a program, uh, which is how do we continue in our teaching and in our research and in our scholarly communications, encouraging this co-adaptation of humanities and sciences through computation and through metaphors. I mean, one of the things that Johanna said that I thought was very interesting was you have to be able to justify why you're using a particular form. I would say that in terms of, you know, kind of the, the, the statement of record, that's true, but I think that it's important that we still maintain this ludic and playful orientation towards metaphor, trying on new metaphors, trying on new types of computation to see what types of uh, hermeneutic openings these things create. We shouldn't be afraid to experiment and explore. Um, second is uh, we really need to invest in the types of facilities that allow these things come together. And I mean that in a very, very financial and infrastructural and literal way. We need to create these spaces where these things happen. Uh, and then also I think it's critical that no matter the domain, that there is a foundational literacy in these computational tools, in visualization, in alternative representations that we need to begin teaching because this playfulness doesn't come out until the mastery of these tools is, is tacit. And finally is to keep having meetings like this and facilitating these conversations in ever wider circles about why um, collaboration that is not naturalized inside of disciplines but outside of disciplines or as we've started talking about de-disciplinary collaboration, uh, making sure that those continue to happen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff for closing thoughts. Um, what, is, what is in here? Um, yeah, just to close, I, I, I do want to put this in, in the wider context. I actually loved it when uh, Prasid Kosla this morning was talking about the, um, the need for, you know, bi-directional reading between the humanities and the sciences and technologies. And I've been involved in a project for several years with um, Cliff Siskin at NYU, Bill Warner at UCSB, um, and Pete DeBola in Cambridge called the Re-Enlightenment Project. And the Re-Enlightenment Project is something where we're really trying to take seriously the idea that we need a new enlightenment for the 21st century, a new enlightenment which makes, uh, which really, go, again, as I said at the beginning, goes back to the first principles of what is this knowledge-making enterprise, how can we reconceive it, and how can we make it um, much more you know, relevant to the public, um, and also progressive in ways that it's not, you know, perhaps not too, too progressive at the moment. Uh, we use the word de-disciplinary because anything which is uh, inter, trans, multi, whatever it is, disciplinary, um, necessarily still has that idea of the disciplinary home. Um, we're about to do a conference in a few weeks' time where what we're trying to do is get people to speak not from their disciplinary bases, but um, to search out what um, Gerald Holton talked about in the thematic origins of scientific thought. What are those discourses that are going on across society, across the humanities, Humanities, across the social sciences and across the natural sciences, which are very much part of our culture. Halton, for example, talks about um, discontinuity in nonlinear math, in quantum mechanics, in history in terms of revolutions, and in art um, at the uh, turn of the 20th century. So how do we locate those de-disciplinary discourses? How do we foster them and use them to create new kinds of knowledge object which represent and explore new forms of epistemology and ontology. Thank you.